Now, of course, we're all here for the same purpose this evening. Uh, the title is Exiting the Crisis. <laughs> Ste steps to Confidence and Growth. Now, it's even a more challenging title than we first <laughs> agreed upon. It. Um, there's not a person in the room who isn't fascinated by it and deeply interested in your observations uh, about it. Uh, no one has to be reminded of the, the importance yeah. of the matter of the European economy, uh, not only to the United States, but the entire global economy. So we're deeply interested in it. We've all watched with great attention the step-by-step -step struggle with it, which continues. And in the ambassador's role, of course, as head of the European Union's delegation to the United States, uh, he's uh, well equipped to discuss it. Now, I had this image of him wringing his hands and worrying about this constantly, but for the last hour and a half, he's been watching Portugal's soccer team in action, <laughs> which, which epitomizes the European enthusiasm for that particular sport. Uh, and of course, it's a wonderful part of the, the European way of life. Uh, Ambassador Almeida, uh, as a graduate of Lisbon University, received his degree in history from that institution. He studied uh, journalism and management uh, in the United States, United Kingdom, uh, France, and, and Japan. And for seven years was a, a journalist before he joined uh, uh, the European Commission. Uh, at the European Commission, he in his early career worked very closely with three of the Commission's presidents. He later was a senior official on the uh, uh, general Directorate, or the Directorate General, for uh, Culture and, and Education. He also served as a Deputy Chief Spokesman uh, for the European Commission. Uh, and then for, for five years, uh, he had the fascinating position of being uh, Head of Cabinet uh, to uh, uh, President Barossa of the Commission. Uh, in that position, he was his personal representative uh, to E8 and E 20 or G20 uh, uh, summits and also was his personal representative to the negotiations on the Treaty of Lisbon. A few years ago, 2010, he was appointed to his current position. So he's had a uh, very interesting career deeply involved in the workings of the European Commission, the European Union in general. Uh, it's an enormous pleasure to have him with us uh, this evening. Uh, Joao Valle G. Almeida. It's a great pleasure to introduce you. Good evening, and uh, thank you very much for being uh, with us tonight. It's a pleasure to be in Baltimore. I had, uh, I had uh, the most uh, unusual speech preparation time. <laughs> watching my soccer national team winning against Bosnia Herzegovina by 6-2. <laughs> so uh, it's the best uh, psychological preparation for any event of this kind. Uh, I suffered a little bit half, uh, you know, in the first half of the game, but at the end of the day, thank you, mate. At the end of the day, uh, I came here uh, reassured about the capacity of Europe to overcome the crisis. <laughs> at least the capacity of my home country's national team to overcome uh, Bosnia. But you have to start somewhere. So thank you all for coming. Uh, thank uh, Frank Bird and the Baltimore Con uh, Council on Foreign Affairs for organizing this. Thank all the sponsors and all that made the, this uh, evening uh, possible. I had been invited by, by you uh, earlier in the year. Um, for reasons that uh, have to do with my job, and I had one of my bosses in Washington, I couldn't make it at the time. Uh, at the time, we had agreed on, uh, on a very important theme, uh, something like Europe in the world or uh, the future of Europe, you know. Nice theme, a nice title. Well, this time, uh, you made my life much more difficult, so uh, I think I'm paying a very high price for rescheduling. Uh, this event, but yeah, I take it on me. Uh, uh, but anyway, it is always a pleasure to come and, and meet you, to come to Baltimore, 
we are, uh, of course, very close by. And sometimes when you are too close, you tend to, you know, focus on l longer distance and longer, uh, further away targets. Uh, we've just came from Montana and Utah. We arrived from Utah last night at midnight. And I had uh, the occasion of talking to uh, many people over there and, uh, you know, about, you know, the same issue that I want to address to you tonight. Uh, but I always say different things because, you know, every day there are news in coming out of Europe. <laughs> and every day there are new aspects of uh, the reality over there. But it's uh, with great pleasure that I'm here. Also in Maryland, very close to Washington, D.C., uh, but I'm very glad to acknowledge uh, the importance of the relationship between Maryland and, and Europe. Uh, the port here, Baltimore, that we can see from this beautiful uh, tower and beautiful views here uh, is extremely important for our economic uh, relationship with the, with the U.S., as you well know. Uh, in the state of Maryland, 60% uh, of foreign direct investment comes from Europe. That counts for 65,000 and more jobs created in the, in the state of, of Maryland. So it, it's very important, and I've had a few meetings with the governor, Governor O'Malley, the last one a month ago, in which we went through uh, all the aspects of the economic relations, and I'm very confident that uh, Maryland and Baltimore will stay important partners of the European <coughs> Union as we uh, develop further our economic, uh, our economic links. So what, what do I suggest we do tonight? Uh, first, I would like to allow enough time for questions and answers, a dialogue with you, which is the best way to convey, and for me to convey my ideas, for you to express your concerns and your comments. But before that, maybe a couple of points to allow you and help you and all of us understand a little bit better where we are, where we come from and where we're going to. So I'll try to tell you why I think uh, we have a crisis and what kind of crisis are we talking about. And secondly, uh, to tell you how I think we are doing the right things and now I believe that the euro will survive after all this. And then you can challenge me and uh, <laughs> we will discuss it a little bit. So um, why do we say that we have a crisis in the euro area? And I'll try to simplify or oversimplify for the sake of being brief and clear. First of all, because we had a very serious crisis in 2008. And we should not forget that. This was the most serious financial crisis, economic crisis, in some countries social crisis, that we had since uh, the 30s, since the beginning of the last uh, century. This crisis, uh, like all crises, has a number of aftershocks, have a number of later, later effects. And one of them is now being felt by uh, most of our countries, including the US, which is uh, an impact on the public finances of all our countries. This is the result of a number of factors, I won't go back into that, but it is now being felt particularly in a particularly acute way in some of our member states, the most vulnerable ones. You hear a lot about Greece, you hear a lot about Ireland, you hear a lot about my home country, Portugal, and you hear a lot in the last few days about, about Italy. You may hear about other countries in the, in the near future because some of them had unsustainable levels of deficit and debt, and because the markets have concentrated their attention, focused their attention on some of these individual country situation. But if you look overall in Europe, in the Euro area, our figures are better than the United States figures. If you take deficit, we are, our average budgetary deficit is lower than the American one, if you take public debt, our average level of public debt is lower than the American one. Just to show that these problems, these later effects of the 2008 financial crisis, linked to structural problems of our economies and our societies, are not an exclusive of Europe. They are not limited to Europe or to the euro area. They are a problem that we share with other industrialized uh, country. So this is the main reason why we are in this situation. But there is another one, which is the fact that these most or more vulnerable countries, and I mentioned, I mentioned some of them, 
they don't live in isolation in Europe. They are part of a system. They are part of, of a union of countries, single market, common policies, but they also, some of them, part of an inner core of integrated economies, which are part of what we call the euro area. 17 countries sharing a single currency, the euro, having a single central bank, a single monetary policy, uh, which establishes everything from uh, the level of interest rates to uh, the amount of money that is put in circulation. So when you have a problem in one individual country that is part of a, a very integrated, highly integrated system, you are bound to have systemic effects out of this individual country situation. And this is what we are witnessing now today. You know, Greece is a small country in relative terms in Europe, and worldwide even, even more so, about 12 million inhabitants, but it has had an impact in our system. So much for Ireland and Portugal. So we have the effects of the global crisis in our type of countries, if I may say so, and you have the cumulative effect of the impact in the system of the situation in individual uh, countries. But you have another problem that explains the, the situation in which we are today, is that our economic and monetary union, which is about 13 years old now, is, uh, was not uh, fully equipped to deal with this kind of crisis. And we must recognize that. We didn't have inbuilt uh, all the mechanisms that are required, all the tools that are required to deal with this kind of situation. <coughs> uh, and so we were caught a little bit in a situation where we could not react <laughs> immediately. It took us a little bit of time to create these mechanisms. But of course, uh, you know, uh, markets don't wait for you. Uh, markets want you to uh, react immediately. Uh, and when you are 27 countries, or at least 17 in the case of the euro area, you cannot react immediately. It's very difficult for you to keep the pace of the markets, to challenge the pace of the markets. Uh, because we are 27 or 17 democracies, 17 or 27 governments and oppositions and parliaments and prime ministers and presidents and public opinions and newspapers, I mean, you have the experience here in the U.S., how difficult it is for you to, for the U.S. as a country to, you know, find consensus, to move forward, to react to events. And you have uh, two parties, one president, one Congress. Yeah. Multiply that by 27, and you realize more or less the, the complexity of our system, uh, how difficult it is for uh, democratic systems, and we are very proud of being democratic, we don't want to change that, but democracy has a price. And that's the price of discussion, of trying to find consensus, of disagreements that one needs to overcome in a positive way. So this also is part of our problem. You know, we are under pressure, markets are nervous, impatient, uh, there is a degree of uncertainty, uh, high level of risk involved, and people want, and rightly so, uh, leaders to, to agree, to move forward, to take decisions. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer uh, than, than required. And of course, in our system, uh, which sort of adds to the problem, because we have so many partners, you have so many people talking about these issues, uh, markets and observers and, and the press and all of you, you look at Europe and you every day you listen to five, ten leaders saying things, sometimes different things, because that's part of the debate. But if you look at it from the outside, you have the impression of a big, big noise coming out of Europe, big confusion. And of course, that also is going to feed into the market uh, to add uncertainty and the way it look at Europe. So if you put all this together, you have a pretty good picture of the, of the complexity of dealing with, um, uh, with this kind of problem. And, uh, but you have to add also another aspect of a more political nature. Uh, our public opinion, the voters, the citizens in Europe, uh, they were caught slightly by surprise by the effects of this crisis. Because in the last few years, uh, people sort of, you know, got used to 
consider that there was sub stability in Europe, that the euro was a protecting factor, that they, because they were part of the system, they will be uh, less likely to be affected by turbulence. And they realized that, uh, you know, even if you are protected, because you are protected by the euro and by the system, there is a limit to that protection. And there is a limit to the, you know, to the fact that you can, that you are allowed to forget that you have to do a number of things. You have to implement the right policies. You have to uh, look very attentively toward budgetary uh, policy in order to avoid uh, excessive uh, budgetary deficits. You have to keep control on your public debt. Uh, maybe public opinion, political leaders, our societies were a little bit uh, not enough attentive to this kind of issues, if I may say so. So when the crisis came, when the effects of the crisis were felt, people were slightly surprised and not really prepared to deal with the, with the cost of taking action to deal with these problems. That's why you have in many countries, uh, you know, demonstrations, strikes, uh, big discussions, because the measures are painful. Uh, they impose sacrifices on people and, and people were not expecting that, at least not now, not with this level of uh, intensity. And last but not least, we have all this in a, an international environment which is pro-cyclical, an international uh, environment that instead of alleviating our problems is adding to the problem because uh, the world economy is not growing at the pace that we would have wanted it to grow. Uh, the recovery after the 2008 crisis is not the one that we wanted to have. It's, of course, much less vigorous than what we wanted to have. And uh, our countries, particularly those who are in most difficult situations, they not only have Europe where the economy is, you know, hardly growing now, but you also have other countries in the world that are experiencing problems. Uh, even the emerging economies are growing slower than we would have liked, uh, so much for the United States. In a number of countries, uh, what we should have done after the 2008 crisis is not yet fully implemented. You know, countries that need to redress their uh, deficit and debt are not necessarily doing everything they could about it. We may discuss that later on. And some of the emerging economies that should have for instance, stimulated their internal demand, like China, they are not doing that either. So uh, the international environment is not uh, helping us in dealing with this uh, particular uh, situation. And uh, this requires, of course, a renewed uh, momentum in whatever we do at the international level, whatever we do inside the United Nations, of course, but most, uh, and particularly what we do inside the G8 and the G20. And I may come back to that in our uh, discussion. So this is, you know, in a nutshell, and I'm forgetting some elements for the sake of being brief, some of the elements that characterize e what we can call the euro area sovereign debt crisis today. But there are a few elements that one should not forget. And these are of a structural nature. These problems are added to all those that I've referred to. And these have to do with our competitiveness, the competitiveness of our economies, the capacity of our economies. That means Europe as well as the United States to adapt to the new realities of the world, to challenge the, uh, you know, the competitiveness of the emerging economies, to deal with our problems of aging societies and sustainable levels of financing of our, uh, of our social security and welfare systems. Uh, the skills gap between what we produce out of our schools and what the market wants, and so on and so on. So you have the, the elements that are linked to what I described as aftershocks of the 2008 crisis, plus the difficulties in managing and governing the euro area because of the reasons I mentioned. And on top of that, you have the underlying structural problems of industrialized countries and post-industrialized countries that, of course, don't facilitate uh, our lives. My second point is to see where we are, what we are doing, and why I believe we will, at the end of the day, be able to overcome this crisis. And at the end of the day, we will have the euro uh, survive these particular difficulties. 
Well, first of all, because, uh, because the euro makes sense. Uh, I think it is clear for our countries that have involved and engaged since the late 50s in a process of economic integration. It makes sense for some of them at least, and a growing number, to, to have a single currency. Because once you have the benefits of a single market, and we are today in the European Union half a billion citizens, 500 million citizens. When you have the benefit of this large market, uh, where people, goods, services and capitals can circulate freely, it makes sense when you have common policies, common foreign policies, common trade policy, agriculture, you name it, it makes sense for you to go one step further and say, why not have a single currency? Why should we uh, impose on ourselves the burden of having, in this case, 17 currencies that we have to, uh, to use in our, in our trade, in our exchanges, also for, for tourists, and people circulating. So, you know, the reasoning was relatively easy. Let's go for a single currency. Let's organize ourselves in a way in which we can benefit from the existence of only one currency in our, in our space. Uh, so it makes sense. So, you know, things that make sense, you know, we should at least fight for them. Uh, but more than that, it, it, it has proved to be a major factor in the European integration. And I don't think one can understand the situation in Europe if one does not consider and have in mind that the euro is first and foremost a political project. It is part of what we started in the 50s after the Second World War, which is a project of peace, prosperity and stability in Europe, putting an end to centuries of wars and building a future together among all the Europeans. The euro is part of that. So, it is a mistake to consider or to approach the euro in a technocratic way and say, mm -mm, I don't think this is an optimal currency area. It doesn't have all the little elements that economists believe are necessary. Uh, it's, it's not that nice. Let's scrap it. It's not a technocratic project. It is a political one. And political projects, you have to think twice, three times, four times, and again before you simply consider scrapping it. And our leaders are fully determined to safeguard the euro, to uh, help it survive, because for them the euro is part of a project, of a larger project, which is a European project, by the way, supported by the United States since the Second World War, as part of a reconstruction of Europe, but also, you know, strengthening the European dimension of the transatlantic uh, alliance. And this is a major reason, political one, why uh, I believe we will continue to work to uh, protect the euro from this crisis, we'll continue to work to have it survive uh, uh, this crisis. Because the costs of non-euro should always look at the alternatives to what we are pursuing. And the alternatives to the euro will be much more costly. They will be unpredictable. So, you know, the euro part of a political project that we are, you know, very determined to, to safeguard, an alternative to the euro being certainly much more costly, not only for the countries that are now in difficulty, but also for the other countries. It will be as costly for Greece as it will be for, 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 Euro, uh, for Germany if, uh, if uh, euro goes out of the, of the euro, uh, if Greece goes out of the euro area. It will be as costly for countries in the south as for countries in the north. So I believe that for economic reasons, makes sense, good for consumers, good for investors, because the cost of the non-euro will be much higher than the cost of uh, pursuing uh, this project. And for political reasons, because this is part of a larger uh, European endeavor, uh, I believe that uh, the euro will survive this crisis. And what we are doing, what we have been doing in the last 18 months, is exactly to achieve that goal. We have created mechanisms and tools that did not exist. We have made them permanent. They will be part of our system uh, from now on. We have already made minor changes to our 
treaties, which are our constitution, and we are ready to go even further uh, than that. We have put on the table unprecedented amounts of financial support for the countries that have been uh, put in difficulty, and we are ready to do more. But this, of course, and I'll finish with this point, uh, you cannot isolate the economy, the economy from politics, as you know very well in this country, uh, I believe. You cannot just consider, in a way, in a technocratic way, to solve these economic problems. These are major political issues. And it's only normal that you see, as you, I'm sure you observe from here, that uh, we have a, a, a very lively political debate in Europe. And that sometimes this debate leads to changes in government. You've seen in the last few days a new prime minister in Greece, now a new prime minister in, in Italy. You are going to see elections in Spain in Sunday, this Sunday. Maybe there will be changes of majority, maybe not, I don't know. You have seen a number of changes in, in other countries, and that will continue to be the case. There is a lively political debate in Europe. Because what we are talking about, what we are discussing, what we are implementing is extremely important for our citizens. Extremely important for my generation and for my kids and my future uh, grandchildren. Uh, because we are laying the foundations for either a good future for them or for you know, a situation in which they will, be, they will have lives which are not as good as what we had not as good as the one our parents had. So we're talking here about fundamental issues for uh, the sustainability of our, of our society. So it's normal that you have a political debate. Sometimes I understand that people look at Europe and again see too much confusion, too much contradictions, too much controversy among our leaders, too many people having a say. Again, always remind yourself, multiply by 27 the difficulties you sometimes have in your own country. Uh, and you will understand a little bit better why it is uh, very difficult for us to progress as quickly as people would have liked. And I know that in the United States some uh, people, even outside the markets, in the political world, would like Europe to move faster. We welcome that pressure. I think we should say that we welcome uh, the fact that our friends are worried about us. And our friends would like us to move even faster and be more efficient and effective in the way we deal with this problem. We will welcome that. We accept it as a, as a sign of, of friendship uh, and goodwill. Uh, we may have a few things to say about the situation in the United States as well, <laughs> uh, because we are in the same world. And if there is one thing we learn out of this crisis, is that we are in this together. The 2008 crisis has shown that a problem in a subprime mortgage market in California can affect the whole world. As much as a public deficit and public debt in Greece, which is much smaller than California, can also affect uh, the whole world. And we have learned as well that if we don't join efforts, if we don't act together in a coordinated way, under the G20, under the G8, we won't be able to survive. And, uh, and my last point to you is to say that I'm very happy to discuss with this, this issue with American friends because I believe it's part of my, my mandate in Washington to exactly promote an even closer dialogue between politicians, leaders, congressmen, parliamentarians, business people across the Atlantic so that we can find the right solutions. So Europe is doing its homework. It's difficult. It's painful. It will take time. But we are on the right track. And that's the main message I wanted to convey to you today. And I'll be more than glad to try to uh, uh, respond and comment on your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Well, we thank you for that comprehensive uh, overview. It's a nice framework for the questions which will follow. The question is, what is going to happen to Greece and Italy? I think that's an economic question. Uh, definitely an economic question, yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, these countries are in different situations. Uh, in Greece, we have uh, a, a, a program that has been agreed with the European Union and the IMF. 
under a number of conditions, and the Greek uh, authorities are supposed to implement a number of measures in order to go on uh, uh, being entitled to, to, to financial support. This has been confirmed uh, in the Greek parliament. Uh, we now have a new prime minister, a new government, who has, who, and they have fully committed themselves to implementing this, this program. So we are expecting them to you know, continue in a, in a consistent way on this, on this track. The advantage of this government now is that they have you know, a bipartisan or even more than bipartisan support. They have a larger support in parliament, uh, which is good news. Uh, the prime minister is someone that is very knowledgeable about uh, economic and financial affairs, very knowledgeable about Europe and the international financial scene. Uh, uh, Mr. Papademos, so we are hopeful, we are confident that Greece will move forward in the right direction under very difficult uh, circumstances and within a framework that has been <laughs> negotiated and established. Greece has a, a public finances problem, obviously. Greece has also a competitiveness problem. So what we're doing in Greece, what the Greeks are doing is of course at the same time as they redress the financial situation, they have to implement structural reforms. They have to deal with the pension system. They have to deal with, with the tax system. They have to deal with uh, everything that will improve the competitiveness of their economy if they want to be uh, capable of exporting, capable of being competitive in world markets. Italy is not under assistance. Italy has implemented a number of measures uh, Italy has agreed with the European Union and the IMF that their situation will be monitored, accompanied by uh, European and international authorities. The new government, which is not yet in place, we know the name of the Prime Minister, and again, someone very knowledgeable, very articulate about economic and financial issues, uh, very well known uh, in Europe, knows Europe very well, uh, and very uh, much uh, appreciated by the market. So again, we, we wish uh, Mario Monti the new Prime Minister, the best of chance in, first of all, forming the government and then moving forward. Uh, he has, uh, is now trying to get the support of a larger political basis in Parliament. We hope that will be the case. And, uh, uh, you know, Italy is a, grand, a great country, great economy. Uh, I'm no doubt that Italy we're going to over, is going to overcome this situation. But again, it will take time, it will, it will take painful measures that have been identified and that this government will now implement. Do American leaders uh, understand the political importance of the economic solution? Is that satisfied, Peter? Are American leaders sufficiently committed to the goal of political stability underlying your grand experiment? Well, I still have three years to go as an ambassador. Don't, <laughs> don't, be, don't put me out of my job so soon. <laughs> I want to come next time, next time to Baltimore to say good news about Europe. So, uh, uh, what they say, maybe, mean no. <laughs> no, uh, but I, I don't want to... to run away from your question. I think uh, political stability, political consensus is of course important and particularly important in times of crisis. And we are seeing that in Europe. Let me first and foremost talk about Europe. We see the need in all the countries I mentioned for uh, consensus. You know, in times of crisis you really need to have the country together behind a, a program. Uh, we don't want everybody to agree with everything. That's not democratic democratically possible, but I think a sense of responsibility must inspire us in Europe uh, to try to get uh, uh, the largest possible consensus, because I don't think our citizens will accept anything uh, different from that. That's why you see in Europe, uh, and I mentioned Greece and Italy, where we're trying to build governments that have a larger political support in Parliament than than previous, uh, than previous governments around a very clear program. We are looking at uh, effective ways of moving forward with the largest possible political support. So I'm observing the debate in the United States. You are in the process of 
electing a, a new president and a new Congress very soon. Uh, so I certainly don't want to interfere in that, in that, in that debate. Uh, I may only recall that in the context of the G20, uh, after the crisis, we, and I worked for, you know, inside the G20 for a few years, but in the last summit uh, uh, in 2010, for instance, uh, Pittsburgh summit in 2009, but then again in Toronto in 2010, uh, we were very clear among ourselves, members of the G20, on the need for each country, each region, to contribute to create con conditions for sustainable growth in the future. So we wanted to avoid this crisis from happening again, but we wanted also to create the conditions for the recovery of the global economy. And in that process, we identified measures and uh, you know, approaches that each country and each region should follow in order to contribute to that. And the number of things was said about what Europe should do, and Europe is doing, a number of things were said about what emerging economies should do, and also about what the US should do. So I think in the context of the G20, all the partners expect each partner to implement what they are supposed to implement. And, and that's the sense of what are we, we are expecting from the United States. We're doing it in Europe, painfully, requiring all the, the efforts that I described, aiming at the, the largest possible political consensus to move forward, up to you in the United States to decide the way you want to move forward. But I think all the members of the G20 and the international community are looking attentively at the US because you are a major actor in the international economy. And what happens here matters for all of us as well. Two questions. Um, first of all, you've already said you have three years to go. But the, the, uh, the first question is, what have you learned about the United States that's most important? And the second is, if you had to uh, educate the American uh, about the EU, what would be the first lesson? Well, uh, on the EU, I think my message to the, the Americans is very simple. European Union matters for you. Uh, you may be uh, concentrated on Asia. You may be... Uh, looking at China, uh, because that's where you think the, the growth will come, that's where, uh, you know, things are happening, uh, that's where markets are being created for your own exports and all, uh, and I take it, and uh, we are doing the same in Europe. But that does not mean that you sort of put the EU in the, in the, in the museum box. We are, we are very nice museums, we are very proud of our <laughs> cultural heritage, but we are more than that. And uh, we are your best friends. And in times of crisis, you do need the best friend. But you cannot only remember the best friends in times of crisis. You have to cultivate. You have to you know, uh, invest in the relationship with the best friends. You should not take it for granted. And what I'm saying about the US versus Europe is valid also when I talk to Europeans about the US. Because they also say, well, they don't care about us. Why should we care about them? Well, we should both care about each other because, I mean, is there any other relationship, is there any other partner in the world of this dimension that shares as many values as we share? You know, who can you trust when you have to impose sanctions on Iran? Who can we trust when you have to uh, deal with the Libyan situation? And I could go on and on. And the same is valid for Europe. So we should never forget that. So my message is we are the best friends. We are the best allies. Don't take us for granted. Don't anybody should not take anybody for granted. Let's continue to invest. Our economic relationship has a potential which is not, not fully tapped today. There, you could be exporting more out of the port of Baltimore and you could import more into the port of Baltimore from Europe. Uh, if we lower down non-tariff barriers, if we uh, make our regulations converge instead of diverge. And this will create growth, this will create jobs, uh, and there's more we can do uh, to try to make this world a better place. Foreign policy, as much as the way we govern the world, talking about G20 and others, we have to, together, convince our emerging partners that they have to assume a larger share of the responsibility of running the world. This is not only you know, emerging, and we are very happy to see 
all these millions of people coming out of poverty in China and India and Brazil. But with that should also come a, a more acute sense of shared responsibility in running the world. Uh, you know, uh, it, this has to be a rules-based uh, world economy. You know, we have to protect intellectual property. We have to uh, protect investment. We have to respect human rights. We have to contribute to uh, the challenge of terrorism or proliferation of nuclear weapons or climate change. And I think we don't agree on everything between the EU and the US, and that's normal. But on what we agree, on what is the fundamental core of values and interests, I think we should uh, work together. So this is a very elaborate message. A journalist, a good journalist, which I am not, would put this in smaller, smaller, in smaller sentences, and I can try to do that for you. But here, I think I can be more, uh, more systematic in the, the kind of message I would like to convey, and I'm trying to convey. Uh, here in the United States. What I've learned about the United States a lot. Uh, maybe my main uh, frustration is that uh, I still don't understand how you play baseball. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that's part of my, you know, I'm getting old and, uh, you know, acquiring new, new information and new uh, intelligence is a bit difficult. Uh, but I'll get there. Uh, I'll get there. At the end of my period, I'm sure I can follow baseball better than I do now. Uh, well, that's a, a joke, of course. But uh, on, I learned a lot about the United States. And one thing I learned is, of course, the diversity of your country. And uh, I just came from Utah and Montana uh, last night. And, uh, well, it's very different from what I... <laughs> It's very different from what I saw in Texas a few weeks ago or California uh, earlier than that and what I see in D.C. Or, or Baltimore. And this is, I think you cannot understand the United States by staying inside the Beltway. Uh, and this is uh, something that I'm trying to convey also to uh, people, uh, people back home. You need to understand the diversity of this country. I've been impressed by the dynamism that I see all over the place, including in, in the states that I've just mentioned, which have impressed me. So uh, diversity is, uh, I think, what strikes me as the most important reality. But if I want to be a little bit more analytical, uh, you know, the political system is quite different from ours. Uh, I won't elaborate any further, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's sometimes almost as difficult to understand as baseball. Uh, but again, there again, I'm improving my, <laughs> my knowledge. Uh, we are observing, we have a very direct dialogue with, our, with your administration, your Congress. And I'm now, as we speak, we are now preparing a summit, a EU-US summit. Uh, my two presidents, Van Rompuy and Barroso, uh, will come to meet uh, President Obama in the White House in, uh, on the 28th of November. So we are actively preparing that. We, we would like a message to come out of this summit, which also summarizes my, uh, my, my views here to a certain extent, is that we would like to see uh, them concentrating on ways to promote growth and jobs across the Atlantic, on ways to cooperate better on foreign policy, and global challenges, and uh, I'm sure that uh, the three of them will find ways of making this happen in the, in the future. When do you expect Turkey's application to be seriously considered? <laughs> That's not an accurate, uh, accurate description of the question. <laughs> I see there, I see there uh, an interest, uh, an, additional, an additional twist in the question, Frank. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, well, Turkey is, is a great country, uh, a very important partner of the European Union, a very important partner of the United States. Uh, most of our member states and the U.S. are together with Turkey in NATO. Uh, Turkey has been associated to the European Union since uh, 1963, uh, a long partner of the Union. It has become a regional power, a regional actor and maybe a world actor uh, in, recent, uh, in recent years. Uh, it's a big country, a, you know, a, v a very dynamic economy, and a democracy. And uh, not perfect yet, but a democracy. 
and the country run by an Islamic party. So all these elements, for different reasons, make uh, Turkey an interesting, <laughs> if not a very interesting case, for us to attentively understand and attentively follow. What we are doing on our side is now negotiating the future membership of Turkey in the European Union. A few years ago, Turkey and the EU agreed that it was time to move one, one step further in our association and foresee the possibility of Turkey joining the Union. In order to join the Union, countries need to uh, you know, apply and respect our standards. They have to be a democracy, they have to protect, promote human rights, the market economy, you name it. And they have to be able, willing and able, to adopt and implement, incorporate all our rules in their own system. This is what the negotiations are made for. You know, they, they are made to create the conditions for this to happen and they, did, they will determine the pace in which this will happen. So we engage in these negotiations. We knew they will take a few, a few years, and they will take a few years. Now, what has happened recently is that uh, a number of <coughs> problems came up. On the Turkish side, they are not yet there in terms of the reforms they have to, to implement, but they have gone a long way. They have changed the constitution, they have uh, uh, limited the role of the military, they have improved their record on human rights. We are not yet fully happy, but the trend is the right one. They are addressing the, the issue of minority rights, again, not yet to the full extent that we would have wished, but making progress in the right uh, direction, and all this is good. And this has been accompanied by a a very uh, positive development in terms of the economy of, of, of Turkey. They are now, as you said, growing fast. They are becoming a world uh, actor in the international economic uh, trade uh, relations. And all this is, is good. But Turkey, for the moment, does not recognize the existence of one of our 27 member states, which is Cyprus. For reasons that have to do with the situation in Cyprus, as you know, Part of Cyprus is occupied by, by Turkish uh, military. But it's very difficult for us uh, to you know, accept as a member someone that does not recognize the existence of one of our members. Uh, very difficult, if not impossible, for us to do so. And this has had an impact on the, the pace of the negotiations. On our side, we have to recognize that in some of our member states, in some sectors of our public opinion, people have begun to question the, the wisdom of uh, Turkey's membership of the European Union. A few doubts have been expressed to the point that certain leaders said that they were actually not in, in favor and that in any case, in some of our countries, a referendum will have to be organized before Turkey would join. So this expression of democratic views has also, of course, created some frustration on the Turkish side. So I'm, I'm being brief about this, but just to say that as we speak today, these negotiations are not in their best moment. Uh, we are uh, trying to find ways of making them progress, and uh, I'm certainly am not able to give you any date of when they will be over or when uh, Turkey will join. We remain committed to have creating the conditions for Turkey to join the European Union. We remain, uh, we believe that this is a good thing for Europe and for Turkey, but we are still far away from that. This being said, and this is valid for the US, uh, and I give you my personal opinion, I think it's very important that we strengthen the links with Turkey, that we try to cooperate as much as possible with Turkey on foreign policy, on economic issues, on defense and security issues. They are in a very sensitive region. They are neighbors to Iran and Iraq, very close to Russia, very close to Israel, neighbors of Syria, uh, you know, in the, in the corridor for any energy alternative to supply from Russia. Uh, and I could go on, identifying strategic uh, reasons for the importance of Turkey. But there is one that has come up recently, 
which I think is very important. And it has to do with the Arab world. It has to do with the Arab Spring. And it has to do with you know, models and references that uh, these countries in the Arab world aspiring for democracy uh, should have in their way forward. And the fact that Turkey is fundamentally a democracy. Uh, Turkey is run by an Islamic party and still a democracy. I think it's a very important reference for the debates that we have to have in the Arab world as much as in our societies when we address the issue of the future of the Arab countries after the Arab Spring. Uh, I referred to a very interesting speech by Secretary Clinton the other day where she dealt with some of these issues. So it's an, an additional reason for us to be attentive to what happens in Turkey, be committed to strengthening our relations with Turkey. That's what we are doing on our side any, anyway. She would like a, uh, a short list of the steps that are being taken to solve the crisis and would like to know uh, what role Russia can play constructively in this. Well, as far as, <clears throat> as, far as Russia is concerned, Russia is part of, um, of our neighborhood. It's, uh, we have a border with Russia, the European Union. Um, several countries have bordered with Russia. Uh, if there's one thing you cannot change, it's geography. So they will remain neighbors of ours uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and they are part of Europe. They consider themselves, I hope you do as well, uh, as uh, European, as part of European civilization. And uh, at least that's what uh, President Medvedev and Prime Minister Putin tell us uh, again and again. And we are engaged in a partnership with Russia, uh, very strong links in all sorts of, uh, of areas, and we want to reinforce that. We hope that Russia will become a member of WTO very soon. Uh, and they are members of the G8, they are members of the G20, they are uh, permanent members of the Security Council, so they are, by definition, uh, partners that we have to deal with. And uh, they can contribute as part of the international effort to, as I said earlier, create conditions for sustainable growth in the world. And, uh, and that's the way we see Russia. We disagree here and there, of course, like Americans disagree with Russians, and, uh, and we have our good reasons to do that. But we are in favor of a solid engagement with Russia, and we believe Russia can and should assume, and is already assuming it's part of responsibility in trying to govern this uh, complex uh, world. As far as the measures that we are taking, I, we could stay uh, uh, long here if I go into the details, but let me give you, uh, you know, five areas in which we are working to be, to be a bit more specific. First is Greece. We need to uh, find solutions for Greece. We, I replied to questions on Greece earlier. Uh, this has to do with unsustainable levels of deficit and debt that, have, that need to be brought down. Uh, this implies programs that we are supporting, financial assistance. This requires commitment from the Greek authorities and sacrifices from the Greek people. But this also implies structural reforms that would create conditions for growth after. Austerity does make sense if it is not a, uh, or implemented in view of future economic growth and job creation. The second is uh, the crisis mechanism that we have created. We need to give them sufficient firepower I won't go into the details, but we need to be able to have the financial facilities armed with enough leverage in order to address the situations that are there and those that may come in the future. We need to work uh, on the banking system. Some of our banks need recapitalization. Some of our banks need access to funding so that they can perform their role, fundamental role, which is to support the real economy. We are doing a lot on this front. But, and we need to deal with governance, the uh, fourth element. As I said earlier, our system was not fully equipped for this kind of crisis. Our decisions were too slow, too complex. We need to change that. We need to strengthen the role of the center of our system as opposed to uh, individual uh, countries' autonomy in certain areas. We need more Europe instead of less Europe in dealing with this crisis. And last but not least, we cannot lose the sight of growth. We cannot forget that growth, job creation, is the purpose of all this. You know, we are not making all these sacrifices 
if we cannot guarantee, at least have the prospect, of having more jobs for our children in the, in the future. Uh, again, the same debate is here, right, uh, in the United States. You know, our societies, industrialized, post-industrialized societies, facing structural problems of our own, facing the challenges of competition from the emerging economies, uh, we have to do our own work, we have to do painful, take painful measures at, at home, but that has to be seen as a step towards growth, more growth and more jobs. Maybe a different kind of growth, there's all the issue of environmental sustainability, there's the whole issue of, of uh, you know, how you consume, uh, what's the purpose of consuming, I will go on in, uh, in, uh, in a very interesting debate, I'm sure, but we need growth so that we can uh, uh, create more jobs for, for the future generation. So you have here five areas in which we are working uh, in, uh, and uh, you know, we can continue more specifically, but there's a lot on our plate, there's a lot going on in Europe, uh, and uh, I believe the markets will recognize that uh, in the process of implementation of all these measures that I'm referring to. And uh, one thing I can guarantee you, uh, my leaders are fully determined and fully committed, and I see um, a, a strengthening political consensus. If you take a look at what's happening in Germany these days, uh, where Mrs. Merkel is saying very clearly, again, I believe yesterday in the party congress, CDU's congress, uh, she was very clear about where she wants to go. For her, this is uh, an important serious crisis for the European project. For her, the solution is not going national, the solution is going European. The solution is strengthening uh, the, the mechanisms that uh, have made Europe the success that it is today. We are facing another stage, another step in our uh, process that requires uh, full European commitment. The last question of the evening is, uh, <laughs> what's your worst case scenario? Well, there are a few rules for, for those who do my job, uh, and, <laughs> and the absolute rule is not to reply to your question. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't, want to, I don't want to sound rude, <laughs> uh, and I, I appreciate your question. It makes sense. It's an honest and intellectually honest question, and um, I, think, uh, I think Europeans, at least I try to keep that memory. They have a memory of worst cases, and our memory of worst cases is a very tragic one. So... Uh, I don't want to comment on what could be the worst cases in this particular situation. <laughs> I want all of us to think of worst cases of the past that led us to start this integration process. I think this is a strong enough argument to say that we should continue the European project. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful evening. We thank you.